morning. I, I really believe, Kevin, that every time I preach, you guys sing that song before I come up. I really do. And every time I'm like, we should just keep singing that song. Like, that's going to be better than what I say as I continue singing that song. So thank you, praise team. Um, what an amazing day for our baby dedication. Um, we love this opportunity. We know that in this past year, it, it has been a little bit different. Um, our last, I think, baby dedication, if I'm correct, was last January. It was a year ago. And so uh, we typically do this in May on Mother's Day and in September as well. Um, but we were excited. We had 10 families uh, and only two you know, could participate this morning. But we look forward to our May and September hopefully to get the rest of those eight babies up here um, for that dedication. We know that, you know, the timing is not always right, um, but we were glad that we get to continue this in here um, and do this because this is part of our faith at home. Um, Brett wanted me to preach on faith at home, and I was like, I feel like I always preach on, on faith at home. Um, but we, uh, for the past five years, uh, started this ministry here with the goal and the intention is to equip and encourage our families and our parents and our grandparents and our siblings and our aunts and our uncles and everyone to just dive in and to be uh, very um, intentional about raising the next generation up for the Lord. Um, and that's the goal. So over the year, so a typical, you know, we'll say 2019, over our typical year, we would have three different baby dedication classes, one before each of our baby D's, as we call in the office, um, each of our baby D's, we would, you know, have a class. Then we'd do a class for our entering kindergarten. Then we'd have one on baptism for our parents to kind of teach our kids about baptism and have those conversations. We'd have two on technology, one with kids that are younger and one with kids that are a little bit older, upper elementary and older. And, you know, and just for parents on, you know, just how do you navigate the waters of technology? Uh, we would also do one called Adolescent 101, which that's a two-hour class, and it really needs to be a, probably a two-year class on helping parents navigate what it's like to have kids go through adolescence. You guys know it's bonkers. You guys know it's crazy. That's why it's a long class. And then we have um, a, a Senior Sunday class. Um, uh, you know, we do you know, our Senior Sunday up here as well, and then we have an awesome dinner um, and just a deal for those seniors. And we're looking at how to revamp that. And just to be honest, 2020 was not great for our classes here, for our faith at home, but we know that you guys have spent a lot of time at home. Um, if you're not using our Right Now media resource, that is so good. It is a free resource that has kids stuff to everything else um, for you and your family to kind of just grow together at your house, um, grow in God's word. Uh, so if you have that, you can go to our website. You can contact someone from the office. We would love to get you on there. It's just free for you guys. But in 2020, we have spent some weird times at home. We spent a lot of time at home. Um, and so faith at home is broader than just these two families or the 10 families that have had kids the past few years. Or if you have little kids, it's a little bit bigger than that. So if you're here right now, this is not going to be a baby dedication class. So 98% of you are like, well, this doesn't apply to me. I'm in college. I am a grandparent. I'm out of here. This is, or I'm in high school. I'm not even thinking about this yet. Uh, trust me, this is for you. But what we're going to do is I would typically do a 45 minute class on our baby dedication class. I'm going to boil that down I looked at my watch because I'm going to have one on. We're going to boil that down for the next, like, 16 minutes. I'm going to be up here, hopefully, 16 more minutes. I'm going to do this whole class for everybody. Um, because what we talk about for our parents is for everybody. Um, to grow your family, um, whatever that family may be like. And so, for us, so we have a foundation verse that we talk about. Um, and it's called the Shema. Um, you know, we're going to look at it here in a little bit, but it's in Deuteronomy, but it's called the Shema. And the Shema is not just, you know, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. If you look on the screen, it's also Deuteronomy 11, um, and it's also Numbers 15. These three passages make up what the Jewish culture call the Shema. And they would read these as a prayer twice a day. So in the morning when they wake up and at bed, when they go to sleep and at night, they would read these as a prayer twice a day. Now, sometimes they would read all of these. Sometimes they would read just one. 
but it was their kind of foundation verse, not just for their faith, but for every single person. And I'm here to say that this is for every single person, not just for families, not just for parents. That these verses uh, direct us and kind of help us walk through this. The word Shema, you may have heard it before, you may have not. Um, like that sounds weird, you know, from the South. Shema, Shema, you know, how do we say that? Um, it basically means to hear. At the very beginning of Deuteronomy 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, listen. So that's what that word in Hebrew means, is to listen, to hear. So they call these verses the Shema. And all three of those, the two Deuteronomy and the one in Numbers, they all kind of have the same theme around it. But their whole deal, which I love, is that when you hear it, you also will do it. It is implied that when you listen and when you hear the words of God, when you hear that, then you're also going to do what it says. And for us, we have two different words. We would have hear or listen, and then we'd also have obey. But it was an applied obey. And for those of you that are parents and for those of you that are married, uh, you know that there are two different things, right? (laughs) Hearing and obeying and hearing and doing are two different things. When we tell our kids, go put your shoes on, did you hear me? I did. Then why aren't you putting your shoes on? Right? You know, when the wife says, we take out the trash, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And she's like, why aren't you taking out the trash? Hear and obey. But for them, it was all in one. That we hear God's word, and that when we hear it, we do it. We do it immediately. That it holds that much weight. And so for us, in our faith at home ministry, um, we use these verses. We use this verse as a foundation for us to grow our families, to walk with them, to be encouraged. And I love how we did the charge for you as well, that you as a church will rally around our families here. So I want to read Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Those are the verses in the Shema that we're going to look at this morning. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That's where we get the twice a day. Verse 8, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This verse was meant to be a foundational verse for how you should live your life, that you love the Lord your God with everything that you in everything that you have in you. I know for this past year, for the past 10, 11 months, however long we've been in the middle of COVID-19 and the pandemic and, you know, going to church, not going to church, having homeschooling, being at school and not school and you're working from home and there's a lot of question marks. And I'm pretty sure one of the number one questions that you have asked yourself is how? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to do the holidays? How are we going to do birthdays how are we going to do schooling Uh, there is a special place in heaven for you parents that have elementary age kids and older that you're having to help them with online school I'm so glad that our oldest is just four years old there's no way that I could go back and try to do math right now that sounds miserable but but I'm sure you have asked that question how so in order for you to answer the how we have to go back and you have to answer the why why are we here? Well, the number one question that, again, you probably ask yourself, especially when you're getting into the adolescent age and even older, is why am I here? What is my purpose? Why am I in Birmingham? Why am I married to this person? Why do I have this many kids? Why are we here? Why is this my job? Why is this the area? And you might start asking those questions, why? But in order to tackle the how, you have to know your why. There is a author, a neurologist, a psychologist by the name of Viktor Frankl. Um, and he has written some books. He died in 1997, but he's from Austria. Um, he's from Austria, and he uh, is a Holocaust survivor. He was actually in Auschwitz uh, concentration camp. And in his books and in other books and writing, he talk about when he first got to the camp, when he first got to the concentration camp, they stripped him bare, and then they said, here are your new clothes. There's a pile of clothes, and he said he went through, and then he found a shirt and found some pants, and in it, he found a piece of paper. And on it 
was the Deuteronomy Shema verses. And he kept that. And he said, this is my why. He said, you have to know your why to tackle anyhow and to live through anyhow. And so for you as parents and for you as grandparents and any kind of situation that you're in, you need to know your why, why you're here. And I believe that we find that in the Shema today. It's not just an ancient writing from the Old Testament to say, oh, that's cool. It is God's living word that lives with us today and that helps us today and it, and it walks with us. So what I want to do is just look at three things very, very quickly. Three things that I see coming out of these verses in Deuteronomy 6 in the Shema. The first one, if you're taking notes, is putting God in his rightful place. To put God in his rightful place. At the very beginning of Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, at the very beginning of the very first sentence, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It is a declaration statement. And through just a little bit of my research about the Shema, it was known that in the morning and night, when they were to read this first part, this first sentence, that they would cover their eyes with their right hand. And they'd say, okay, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it was a way for them to block out any distractions in their life, anything that has going on in their life, and to really be focused and dedicated to say, this is true. God, you are one. Are you putting God in the rightful place in your life? God belongs in one place, and that's at the top. That's at the top of the pedestal. Everything else follows. And I promise you that there is a battle every hour, every minute, every day of your life to fight for that number one spot. And who are you going to put? What are you going to put on there? And the things fighting for that spot are not all bad. It could be your family. It could be your spouse. It could be your hobbies. It can be your job. It can be your promotion. It can be whatever it is that is fighting for that number one spot, but there's only one thing that deserves to be at the top, and that's God. And are you putting him there every single day? That's why I think praying this prayer, and even in just praying that first sentence every morning when you wake up, God, you are Lord, and you are one, and you are my one, and having that daily reminder, are you putting him in his rightful place? Second thing, I think is having a dedication to pass on and share his love. When you, read, when you read that Deuteronomy verse, it says that you love the Lord with everything that you have in you, and then you impress them on your children. Now again, I don't want to you know, just like alienate half the room in here or more and the people online saying, I don't have kids, this doesn't really belong to me. But I think about who is your family. If we were to have a show of hands, and I won't do it, but... Um, if you were to read Joshua 24, 15, you can put it on the screen, and if I was to ask, how many of you have this written down in your house somewhere? Probably a good portion of you would say, at some point I had this verse written down in my house. And if you don't, you could probably go to Hobby Lobby tomorrow and buy some fake reclaimed barn wood with some fun script and you could put it in your house, right? Which is cool. <laughs> It'd be awesome if we all went down there and sold them out of this verse and whatever they have it, coffee mugs and coasters or whatever it is in your house. But you've heard this before, right? And I like it in the message um, where it says, as for me and my family, we'll worship God. And you might have said, for me and my household, we are going to serve the Lord, right, in other translations. And I like this verse. I like this verse to kind of rally around. But it says, as for me and my family, we will worship God. The question for you that you circle is, who is your family right now? For a lot of us, you probably haven't seen your family in a while. Christmas and Thanksgiving, birthdays, anniversaries. Maybe it's not safe to go and travel miles and hours and on planes and go see parents that are maybe in nursing homes or just people that it's not safe to be around. So, so there might be a lot of people that are like, you know, I haven't seen my family in, you know, a lot. But who is your family? I argue that it is the people that you are around the most, that we make them your family. For, for our college students, is it your sweet mates? Is it people in your dorm, people in your classrooms? Is it people that you work with? Maybe it's over Zoom, maybe you're in person, maybe it's people you know, in your cubicle, your neighbors. One of the blessings 
that we got through, you know, this COVID was I get to know more of my neighbors, just being outside and going on walks. They became our family, knowing them. It's your classmates, it's your coworkers, it's your friends, it's your family, it's your church. This is a family, right? When Mary Beth and I moved here a little over seven years ago, we, we knew like two people. We knew Blake and Holly Beth Harris. Mary Beth went to school with Holly Beth. And we knew Brett and Laney a little bit, again, because Mary Beth was roommates with Laney's sister, Libby. Um, all of our contacts were through my wife. She knew everybody, and, I, and, and we just moved down here. But we didn't know anybody. But this church became our family. This church are the ones that we spent holidays with. I remember going to Easter over at the Ashley's house, right, because they invited us to Easter. That, that, that is our family. These are the people that we call when I'm out of town and my wife has a flat tire, we call the Presleys. We call Stephen. When we were moving into our new house and we had nowhere to live for a few days, God, God bless the Presleys. They got all of us living with them for a few days, right? This is, this is our family. This is the people here. So if you want to make a difference and you said, everyone around me, I want them to serve God, to love God, to grow in him. That's who it is. And and I bet if we were to ask that, would you want your church family? Would you want your work? Would you like your classes? Would you like your sports team? Would you like your dorm? Would you like your dorm room? Would you like your friend group to, to, to dive deeper in their relationship and love with God? I bet every single one of us would say, yes, yes, I do. We can make that happen through him. We can make that happen. Having that dedication to say, I want the people around me, my family, to love the Lord. And it starts with you. It starts with you. With our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, it starts with you. That's what I tell in my 45-minute baby dedication class. If I was to boil it down to one slide, it is this that it starts with you. I cannot teach my 17-month-olds how to love Lord right now, but I can strengthen myself. You can't right now maybe teach your roommates how to love the Lord the most, but you can do that with yourself right now. And it starts growing inside of you. And for you that have parents, I'm going to do a little side note. For you that are parents, if you have parents that are young age, right now their spiritual ceiling is your spiritual ceiling. Now, one day they're going to grow up and they're going to be sophomores and juniors in high school. They're going to go off to college and they're going to be on their own and they're going to have their own faith. And we're excited for that. But when they're at a young age, their spiritual ceiling is your spiritual ceiling. Jack, my four-year-old, his ceiling is mine. So what do I need to do? I need to raise my spiritual ceiling. I need to fall more deeply in love with God. I need to serve him more every day. I need to strengthen my relationship with him so I can pass it on to the next generation. So I can pass it on to those around me whoever that may be, whatever family that you have. I love in the Deuteronomy 6, if we go back to that 4, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. See how it starts with you? All your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Are you doing this daily? Not just parents, but everybody with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Do you remember the last time your heart would beat fast? Where your heart kind of skips a beat and it beats fast? I remember having that when I was dating my wife and you get a phone call or a text and it's, oh, it's Mary Beth. And I would get excited. For those of you that are older, maybe you got a beeper, you got a page, right? And you look down and you're like, oh, I forget what the pager number one for like, I love you is, whatever. But you're like, oh, there it is. Oh, it's them. Maybe if you're older, I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you sent Morse code. Maybe you did a message in a bottle. I, I don't know how you communicated back then. But right when you have that communication, you're like, oh, my heart's beating fast for them. When she walked down the aisle when we got married, my heart was beating fast. When my kids were born, my heart was beating fast. Whenever I watch Star Wars movies, my heart beats fast, Right? If you ride a roller coaster, your heart beats. But, but you know that feeling. When is the last time that your heart beat fast for the Lord? Where you got excited? Maybe it was when you were baptized, church camp, 
Honduras, whatever it may be. There may be times in your life where your heart was beating fast for God. My prayer for you is that we're a church, that every single morning that we can say this prayer and that our heart beat fast for God, knowing that every day is a day that we get to partner with the creator of the world. We get to partner with him and say, God, where do you want me today? How can I live for you? How can I seek you? How can I serve you? How can I be your hands and feet? And what adventure do you have for me today to serve you? If that doesn't give you goosebumps, I don't know what will, because God wants to partner with you. Does your heart beat fast for the Lord or does it beat fast for other things? Which is good if it's other things as well. But again, what is the number one spot for you? In this rightful place, that's where your heart should beat fast. And in your soul, everything inside of you, from your toes to the top of your head, does your soul thirst for God? Is it what you think about? Is it what you dream about? Everything inside of you. And with all of your strength. As some translations say, with all of your might. And for a lot of us, sometimes it is a struggle. We have distractions, we have life, we have hiccups, we have rough times saying, okay, I don't know what's going to happen, but I have to fight for this. With all of your strength. Sometimes you got to fight to get up here to be at church this morning. If you're at home, it may be even just a little bit harder because you're like, well, I can watch it later. But are you fighting to be in this place? Are you fighting to grow? Are you fighting for your family to grow and to see him and to love him with all of your might, with all of your strength? Do you make that a priority? My prayer is that in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, and the rest of the Shema verses, that we as a church rally around this. Whether you're an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a great-grandparent, a parent, siblings, neighbor, friend, coworker, Facebook friend, whatever it is. You say, I'm going to love God, and it starts with me, and I have a dedication to pass it on to everyone that I'm around. Because that's how things are going to change. If we're tired of the way things are in our communities and the hatred and the ugliness and everything, it starts with you and your dedication to the Lord and to pass that on to other people. And it starts with the next generation as well. We pass that on. We get an amazing opportunity every week um, to partner, to sit, and to be with God in our time of communion. That's what we're going to go in right now. It's this time that we get to sit with him. And we get to, to, to recognize and to see and to be thankful for the life of Christ, for the gift that we have in Jesus and also for his sacrifice on the cross for us. This is a gift that we receive from God, that that he gave his all, with all his soul, with all his heart, with all his strength, died for us, that we could be with him forever. And so we're going to take communion here in a second. And what I want, um, you take communion however you normally take communion, but if you want, we're going to have the Deuteronomy 6 verse up. Maybe this is a time for you just to pray this silently and read this silently, this prayer, this scripture, as you kind of focus in on the life and death and gift that is Christ that we receive from God. Let us pray. God, you are holy. You deserve to be at the number one spot. I pray that we as a church family fight for this, that we fight to keep you at the number one spot. And you're at the number one spot because you are the creator of the earth and you are full of love and grace and mercy and it is shown through your son to us. And we are so thankful for the gift of your son, but we are thankful for this time that we get to celebrate him and what he has done in our lives. We are thankful for the bread and for the cup that represent his body and his blood. God, may we hear your words and do them. May we we live for you and pass on that love and mercy and grace that you've shown us to those that are around us. Be with us as we take this communion. It's in your holy son's name that we pray. Amen.